going to go to Facebook Live as well. Just... One moment. Who thought we'd be doing this again? And here we are again. Yeah. Here we are again. We're old. Yeah. Say again. We've become experts at all of this yeah. Zoom stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to start in just one minute's time. I'm going to go live on Facebook and we're going to make a start in a moment. I'm just going to mute everybody before I begin. Hi, Oni. Hello, hello. Who's that? Paul. Oh, welcome. How are you doing? This is all your fault. <laughs> fantastic. I'm delighted you're with us. That's fantastic. Big welcome to you. A big welcome to everyone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly pasture share. I'm delighted to see so many of you logging in. You're also on Facebook Live. Um, and it's great to see you. And uh, I want to dedicate this evening's share um, in, in honor of Rabbi Lord Sachs and Diane Erentro that they should have a speedy recovery. And the thorough learning that we do should be a zuchut and a merit for them to, uh, to be well. I'm just muting the participants so everyone can hear. But if at any point you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and take part. Let's try and make this a little bit interactive and a little bit interesting. If you have a chumish at home, you're welcome to follow in the chumish. Or you can just listen along. There is no prior knowledge needed for this, for this Torah class. Um, it's just about participating, enjoying, and learning something, hopefully. Some inspiration during this time. I think, you know, somebody said to me, the one big difference of this lockdown and the previous lockdown is the days are shorter, it's a lot darker, it's a lot more dreary. So we need to try and find creative ways to interact and to try and raise our spirits, even though many people are feeling... Um, not so uh, not so motivated. We've got to try and find that motivation to make sure we can still tap in to some spirituality and some Torah learning, learning, and, learning, learning. Um, to do so in, in that way. So, on that note, I'm going to begin with the opening of this week's Sedra. This week's Sedra is called Parshat Vayera. Does anyone know, and feel free to unmute yourself, what does the word Vayera mean? Anyone? Any takers? So Vayero means, and he appeared. Who appeared? The Almighty appears to Abraham. The narrative begins in this situation. It's three days after Abraham's had his circumcision. He's a very old man. He's sitting by the entrance to the tent. And the Almighty appears to him. And he's sitting there. And all of a sudden, the Pesach says, Vayisra Enoch, he lifts up his eyes. That's Abraham. And he sees Vayar, and he sees, There are three men-like figures approaching him. Now, we're going to talk about who those three people were in a moment. The commentators explained, beginning with Rashi, that they were angels. There were three angels coming to him. Why was he sitting by the entrance of the tent? Because Abraham was known for what? What was the characteristic of Abraham? He hospitality. Was, hospitality and kindness. He was the kindness, kind of person. That was his middle. That was his character trait. Now, what's very interesting if I was to ask you, what is it that makes somebody kind? Tell me in a sentence, what is it? If you were to, to say that the defining characteristic of somebody who's kind is what? What is that? Sensit sensitivity to others. Sensitivity to others, good. Any well, other I was gonna say, I was gonna say empathy for others. Empathy, empathy. Em empathetic, absolutely, sensitivity. Well, I wanna share with you something fascinating. And this is really, really interesting. This is um, brought by Rabbi Meir Bergman. He explains the following. What word repeats itself again and again at the beginning of our portion? It's the word Vayera, Vayar. It's the word for eyesight. And Rabbi Bergman explains something fascinating. For somebody to be considered kind... Can you make it louder? Can I make it louder, Stella? Uh, I think it's as loud as I can on my, on my screen. On your, or maybe at your end, you can make it louder. But Rabagman says the following. He says, 
that in order to be a kind person, you need to open up your eyes. You know, we are all very quick to want to do good deeds. But if you do not have that sensitivity of noticing when somebody else is lacking something, there is a problem. And he explains that an open heart is great, but you've also got to have the perception to be able to see. And there are so many times that people in our life have something that they need and we don't even notice it. And therefore the Torah is teaching us that the first step to become a truly kind person is to be somebody who's able to open up their eyes as well as their heart. And he, and he shares two incredible stories, uh, two amazing stories where my friend brings these stories and I wanted to share them with you. One story is, is more well known, one is less well known. The story is told of the base Halevi. It was a, the eve of Passover. And a Jew comes in to him and says, Rabbi, I've got a question for you. Am I allowed, on Seder night, there's a mitzvah to have four glasses of wine. Now, am I allowed to fulfill my obligation with four glasses of milk? Right? Now, the answer is, of course not. You need to have four cups, cups of wine at the Seder night. But the Beis HaLevi explained the answer to the man. And immediately after the man left, what did he do? He sent to his home enough money, not just for wine, but for meat for Passover. Because he said, if anyone's coming to me to ask me this question, you can read between the lines. They don't have enough money for wine. They certainly don't have enough money for meat for their Seder night. This is what it means to be a Baal Chesed. Seeing, perception, reading between the lines. There's a story told with Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, the Rosh Hashiva of Baltimore, where there was a, a divorced lady who came to see him. And this lady, she had three young children, and she wanted to know if she was obligated to buy a sukkah. Women are exempt from sitting in the sukkah. Could she get away without buying a sukkah? And he explained to her, according to the strict letter of the law, she was correct. She didn't have an obligation to buy a sukkah. But he said to her, you are an ishoch shuva, a very distinguished woman. And it was vital for her to set the example for her children of the festival of Sukkot, of what it means to celebrate the festival in the true, proper sense. So what did she do? She, he, she came home and she found on her doorstep a brand new sukkah that the Rosh Hashiva had organized in honor of the festival. This is what it means to be a Baal Chesed. A Baal Chesed isn't just about doing the right thing and trying to be kind. It's about opening your eyes and having that extra dimension of perception of seeing when something's going on. Now, I want to share with you a short clip to try and bring this a little bit to life. An amazing story of an amazing lady who's almost as old as you, Stella. She's only 102, I think. So uh, she's a little bit younger than you. But I want to share this story with you. Let me see if I can find it on my screen. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. Please, ladies and gentlemen, watch this short clip. Oh, beautiful. Hey, Couldn't be better. Second. Welcome to Instagram Live. Is this your first venture on Instagram Live? Sorry, if I, I this ask... is my second Instagram Live. The the first one. Here we go. Feed. Okay. Nine hundred children every single week. <laughs> Look at this smile. <laughs> my name is Clara Hammer, and I'm called the Chicken Lady of Jerusalem. <laughs> I know what hunger is. I was a, a child in prison when I was 12 years old. When Russia chased us out, there was a border line between Russia and Romania. The man who caught us crossing put us into jail. We were seven weeks in jail. I have never, never, never forgotten that what it means to be hungry, what it means to cry. I want another piece of bread. And the mother says, I'm sorry, I don't have. There's a butcher in the neighborhood called Hacker. 27 years ago, almost 30 years, she used to buy at our butchery. And she saw how some poor people would come to buy the bones and the skin. He put on the counter a huge plastic bag and it was skins and fats. I said to Maton Hacker, from today on 
You do not give them the bones. I will pay the bill for them. Since then, she started her whole empire, all her charity work, in order to give to more than 120 families. The butcher it gets every single week $1,200. This computer is entirely for Mrs. Hammer. Yes, I should be well and be able to carry on my work. I'm going to be called Dr. Clara Hammer. You should love your neighbor or your friend as thyself and help. The main thing is to help others. This is up to us, to you, to people, to do. <sighs> so there you have a remarkable example of a Balat Chesed, of somebody who spent and dedicated so much of her life to kindness. And what was remarkable about her, not just the charity work that she did, but that her eyes were wide open. She walked into the butcher, she, sh she saw that he was giving the poor people bones and skin, and she said, that's not happening anymore. Her eyes were open and she saw a cause and she fought for it and she helped so many people for so many years. Okay, so that's the Vartara number one. I'm now going to uh, tell you another idea, another interesting idea on the po po portion. So what's fascinating is the first Rashi of this week's Edra. There's a, a very interesting Rashi right at the beginning of the Sedra that tells us about these three angels. Remember I mentioned at the beginning, he's sitting at the entrance of the tent and there are three angels that arrive. So it says Rashi, right? There are three people that come. Why three? Where were they, what were they doing? So it says Rashi, One of them was coming to announce that Sarah was going to have a baby in a year's time. The job of that Malach was to come and break that news. Right, the Echod Lahapach is Sodom. One was coming to destroy the city of Sodom. We all know the story of the city of Sodom, which was destroyed. But Echod Lerapos es Avraham. And one of them was coming, the angel Raphael was coming to heal Abraham from his circumcision. Now says Rashi, this amazing lesson She'ein Malach Echod Oso Shluchos, that you never have one angel doing two jobs. Now, whatever this means in the mystical world, we understand, according to Jewish tradition, that an angel has one role. But then there's a very strange final line of the Rashi. Rashi concludes and says, the Raphael and the angel of Raphael, Sherapes Avraham, that came to heal Avraham, Holach Misham Lahatzel Eslot. He then gets a second mission, and he then goes directly from having healed Abraham on mission number two, to go and save Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham, who lived in Sodom, who was in bleak danger, and this Malach has a second role. So the question is an obvious one. Rashi famously tells us that each angel has one specific job, but then suddenly angel number three gets another job. What's going on? He's part-time, he's got two roles. What, what on earth is going on? The final sentence of Rashi is very, very strange. I want to share with you a beautiful answer that I heard in the name of Rab Shloyma Kluger. Rab Shloyma Kluger lived from 1785 to 1869, and he was the, the Maggid of Brody. He was a Dayan, he was a preacher, he was a Dayan in Galicia for over 50 years, and he was a very well-known rabbi and, um, and commentator and, and great scholar. And the following story took place when he was appointed the Rav of Roida. Roida is a place in Galicia. He was appointed to be the rabbi. And upon arrival, the following situation took place. There was a baby born, and there was a Brit Mila, a circumcision that needed to take place. But unfortunately, the father of the baby was deadly ill. He was a gosais, which is the expression used in halacha that he was at death's door. And the family wanted to delay the bris, they didn't want to do it on the eighth day because they wanted to delay because they anticipated the father would die and they would name this child after his father. As the Jewish custom to give Hebrew name of, of ancestors, let this child have the name of his father. Now, when Rabbi Shloyma Kluger got news of this, he immediately sent sent message to the family that they must go ahead with the bris immediately. You do not delay a bris for any reason, unless, of course, medical reasons go ahead with it, and remarkably, the father improved. And not only did he improve, 
he completely recovered and they thought this new rabbi that they just hired was some miracle worker. What was going on? Now, when Rav Shlomo Kluger wrote in his Sefer, Shai Torah, this story, Shai La Torah, he explains the following. He said, how did I know how to conduct myself? It was based on this Rashi that we just learned. The Rashi that we just learned in Parshas Vayera. Because the Rashi tells us that originally, God did not send an angel specifically to save Lot. For whatever reason, Lot was not meritorious enough to be saved. However, when the, Lot, the, the Malach was going already to save Abraham, it was in the merit of Abraham that Lot was saved. And therefore, the Malach came, he saved him, and it was in somebody else's merit that he was saved. So Rav Kluka deducted from that, we know that when a person has a circumcision, we know that Malach, we know that Eliyahu Novi comes, and, El, and also the Malach Rafal comes when somebody has a bris milah, like this in this week's Sedra, to Avraham. And therefore, maybe, maybe, if they do the bris milah straight away, while Eliyahu Novi is there, while the Malach Rafal is there, maybe the father of this boy will be saved from his terrible fate. And therefore, that's how he deduced it, based on this week's Sedra and this week's Rashi. So there we have two answers. And the third answer from the Chedush Harim, it's a little bit complicated and involved. I'm going to skip it for now. And maybe if there's time at the end, I'll tell that to you. Okay, let, let's, let's move forward. Now it's time for the riddle question of the week. And I've, if Gary's on the phone, let's see if, if Gary's on the line, let's see how, if he knows the answer to this or if anybody else knows the answer to this. When is the first time, and feel free to unmute yourself, that love is mentioned in the Torah? First time we mention love. Please unmute yourself. Or write in the comments, when is the first time love is mentioned in the Torah? Anyone? Any Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. Good guess. Good guess. Isaac and, Isaac and Rivka. Well, you're absolutely correct. It's Abraham and Sarah. It's Abraham and Sarah, right? Sorry, not Sarah. Sorry, it's Abraham. Abraham's half right. But who, who was he loving? Who does he love? I suppose Yitzhak. Correct. Absolutely correct, Gary. He liked, he loved Yitzchak. And we see this in the final chapter of our portion, when Abraham is commanded, possibly the most confusing and difficult command anyone's ever, ever received, the command to go and sacrifice his son, the Akedat Yitzchak. And if you look in Parak Kafbet Posik Aleph, it says, by he after these things, what are these things? That's a separate topic. Alukim Nisois Abraham, the Almighty tests Abraham. The biggest test of his life. The Marblim says that actually this was to test his emunah, his faith in the Almighty. We know that he went through 10 tests. I spoke last Shabbat about the tests that we're all going through now, the test of faith through coronavirus. This was the ultimate test. Abraham was told, go and take your son. And it says, take kaches bincha, your son, es yechidcha, the only son, asher ahavta, the one which you love. This is the first time the word ahava is found in the Torah. Go and take this son, and do what to him? He's commanded to go and shecht him, slaughter him. Now, we all know how the story ends. It's got a happier ending, and he doesn't get slaughtered. When is the second time in the Torah the word love is mentioned? Second um, time. Isaac Rivka. Correct. The second time is when Yitzchak, Right now that he, he he then goes he says by yeah by Yitzchak or Allah um sorry Imo that um Isaac goes and he inhabits the tent of his mother by Yikach es Rivka and he marries Rivka by Tehila le and he marries her by Yehavia and he loves her right so the second time we see love is then now that's in next week's Edrin Parshat Chayesara so the first time is in Parshat Vayera with Avram loving Yitzchak the second time is Parshat Chayesara with Yitzchak loving Rivka the third time is in Parshat Toldot, in two weeks' time, where it says, Vayehav Yitzchak es Esau, where Isaac loves Esau, because he was side Bethiv, he, he was a great hunter, and Rivka loves Yaakov. Now, let me explain something interesting to you. This whole theme of love gives you a lot of the background to the Jewish concept of love. You see, the very first time that Isaac felt loved was in this week's Sedra. He feels love from his father. The Torah tells us that Abraham loved him. And because he feels that love, he is then able to go on and love somebody else. When somebody receives love and is the recipient of love, they are able to then go on and give love. And the Torah is telling us something very fundamental, that if we want our children to grow up 
and to become loving, productive, well-balanced members of society, we need to show them unconditional love. Children who receive love grow up to be able to become givers of love. And, you know, th there's a fascinating experiment. I don't know if any of you have heard of the, the Pygmalion effect. The Pygmalion effect? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Has anyone heard of that? There's something called the Pygmalion effect. Um, it's a fascinating concept in, in psychology. And in fact, um, I found a short clip that explains exactly what the Pygmalion effect is. I'm not going to share with you all of the clip, but I'll share with you 30 seconds of the clip so that you understand what I'm referring to. Let me just try and share this with you. One sec, one sec. Well done. Okay, here we go, the Pygmalion effect. The Pygmalion effect is the phenomenon whereby higher expectations lead to higher performance. It can be best understood by a circle where our beliefs about another person's abilities influence our actions toward the other person. This action has an impact on the other's beliefs about themselves. The beliefs about themselves cause the other's actions toward us, which again reinforce our beliefs about that person. And so on, and on, and on. Let's look at an example with your beliefs. Okay. So I'm not going to share with you more of that, but the idea is when you treat people a certain way and you have certain expectations of those people, they live up to it. There was a professor in the 1960s in Harvard University called Professor Robert Rosenthal, and he claimed that he told his, his colleagues he could identify which students would experience intellectual growth spurts in the upcoming year and at which point during the year. And he told his colleagues and he told them which students at which time. And it turned out that the exact same thing happened. And the reason why it happened, he explained afterwards, was because the way in which those teachers treated those students was so different to how they treated the other students. They had different expectations of them. When you raise your expectations of somebody and you treat them in a certain way and you show them that love, that manifests in their actions and behavior. And that's one of the things we learned from this week's lecture from love. We see the way that Avram loves Yitzchak leads Yitzchak to go and love Rivka and leads Rivka and Yitzchak eventually they continue this chain of love with their own children. So that's another idea from this week's Sedra. Okay, we will end with one final idea on this week's Sedra and this is a, a, an idea that again relates to the story of the Akedah and the, the, the idea of tests. Now in the story of the Akedah, who is the hero of the whole story? Who passed the test? Who's the hero? Well, I'll go with both Abraham and Isaac. I would say, logically, you would say both of them, but definitely Isaac. I mean, at the end of the day, this guy is being bound and he's about to be slaughtered and he goes, on, he goes along with it and he keeps up the faith. But it's a very interesting thing. The Shulchan Aruch describes something very interesting that when we talk about the mention of the, the, the merit of Abraham in the Arcade, in the High Holy Days, we have this repeated again and again. We just read this Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, specifically on Rosh Hashanah, we talked about the merit of Avraham, who bounds up his son. What about Yitzchak? At the end of the day, this guy's 37 years old, he allows himself to be bound up. Why on earth is he not getting the merit of it? And the answer is as follows. The answer is that dying for the sake of the Almighty, dying our Kiddush Hashem, is not as great as living al Kiddush Hashem. Let me explain. Whose merit was greater? Was it Abraham or was it Isaac? Now, according to all the commentators, it was Abraham. Why was that so? Because the pain of dying momentarily for Isaac, as terrible as that would be, it was all going to be over. But for Abraham, think about it. This was his only child. This was something that he had dreamed of for his whole life. He was infertile for many, many years. And finally, he has a child. And finally, he has a child. Only does he have a child? This is the child who he's promised will be the, the person who carries on his, his legacy. And suddenly, the carpet's pulled from under his feet. And suddenly, he's told he has to take him and slaughter him. And really, the, the message is that in life, it's not really about dying, al Hashem. It's living your life, al Hashem. You know, there's an amazing story told about the Chibina Rov. 
the Shabina Rov, we're having a bit of a Hasidish night tonight. His name was Dov, Dov Berish Wiedenfeld. He lived, he died in 1965. Um, he was the chief rabbi of Chabid in Poland, and then after World War II, he eventually, he spent his final years living in Jerusalem, in Rechavia, in Shari Chesed, and he suffered terribly in his life. He lost in the Holocaust his wife and his two sons and three daughters, and he spent years in Siberia, and he went through tests that none of us should ever even be able to imagine. But he survived the war, and he eventually comes to Israel. And he comes to Israel with two surviving daughters, and his two daughters marry, and one of his daughters gives birth to a baby boy. And this baby boy, as you can imagine, is a tremendous source of comfort to him, of, nakam, of, of nakamar as well, of revenge to the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Look, he's continuing a legacy. And unfortunately, this child takes ill. And this child sadly passes away. And you can imagine how distraught the parents are. But not only are they so distraught, they don't know how they're going to break the news to the proud grandfather. And they leave it to their brother-in-law to go and break the news. And the brother-in-law is, the, the scene is described, pacing up and down outside his front door, not knowing how to tell his father-in-law of the pain of the words to describe what's happened. And when he goes in, he eventually tells his father-in-law, his father-in-law is totally lost and he doesn't speak for a few minutes. And he says the Posek, Lule Saroscha. Lule Saroscha, was it not for your Torah, I would be totally lost. In other words, he picks himself up, he tells his son and he tells his, his daughter and, and his two daughters, we've got to live on, we've got to keep on building. He goes on to have many more grandchildren and many more descendants. But the message of this man, the strength of this man, is the strength of the Jewish people. This idea that even though we go through suffering, Dying our Kiddush Hashem is terrible and is, is terribly sad and an amazing, amazing thing. But living our Kiddush Hashem, that's really the ultimate goal. So to conclude, we've looked at four ideas tonight. We began looking at the idea of kindness. A Balchetet is somebody who opens their eyes and sees a lacking somewhere else. We talked, number two, about the ideas of the three angels. Why was there not a fourth angel? We spoke about the Rashi. We spoke about Rav Shlai Makluga, this idea of the extra merit of Abraham. We then talked about love, ahava, what does love mean? What's the Jewish idea of love? And finally, we concluded with the idea of living by Kiddush Hashem as opposed to dying by, by Kiddush Hashem. What's that, what, what's that all about? I'm now going to invite you to unmute yourself and feel free to ask me any question you wish relating to the Pasha. Happy to have a few minutes of questions. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Apart Can from I ask your... a question? Yeah. I just was wondering what the understanding is as to why Isaac never saw his father again. He never saw Abraham again, did he, after? After the... Well, you know, did you, yeah. Yitzchak did. What, what, um, I think you're referring to is Rivka never sees him, never sees um, Yaakov again when she goes off. But um, as far as I'm aware... I thought, I, is, I thought Isaac went down to the south and his father went in the other direction, but... That was Lot. Lot, Lot, Lot and Avraham split up and they go and live in different places. Um, and Avraham famously goes to save Lot from Sodom. But as far as I'm aware, he does see him again. Okay. I thought, I, mean, I thought not. I thought it was a whole interesting thing about the trauma of having been sacrificed or... Anyway, I'll look that up again and come back I'll to I'll try and I'll try and find an article on the topic to send to you. It's it's a fascinating topic. I must tell you, these portions are so enriched with unbelievable. Yeah, thought. very interesting. And, and really, we it, it's it's very sad we're not really sure to read the parshiot. I, I often feel I wish there were two weeks for each sedra, and we could try and uh, catch up in in in, in Vayikra where it's all about sacrifices and it's harder to relate to. But the stories here are just unbelievable. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Sorry, uh, can I ask a question, Rabbi Yoni? Apart from the obvious connection of the ram and the shofar, remind us why so much of Vayera is read on first and second day Rosh Hashanah. Why do we read it? Well, the, yeah. the, the idea is, the, the, the obvious idea is, of course, as you said, the ram, the, the shofar that was found instead. But the idea is that we say to the Almighty on Rosh Hashanah, even though we've done terrible things in the past year and we've sinned and we haven't been perfect, please don't punish us for our sins, give us a second chance. And so to speak, like metaphorically, we say, let the ram atone for us. We blow the shofar as a reminder of that. that that's part of the idea. Sorry, are you suggesting the Arcada was a sin? 
No, no, no. I'm saying that the Arcade was supposed to be an atonement. In other words, he was going to have to go through this terrible test of having to lose his son, but in the 11th hour, he's saved, and instead a ram is slaughtered. So too, we say to the Almighty on Rosh Hashanah, even though, you know, we look at all our deeds and they're not so great, at the 11th hour, give us salvation, just like you gave Abraham salvation at the Arcadia story. Okay. All right. Anyway, on that, on that note, I want to thank you all for coming. Hopefully by next Thursday night, we'll know who the president of America is. Hopefully. <laughs> um, Very unlikely. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yanni. All the best. Bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.